I got an exciting episode for you where I'm going to show a recent interview that took place on Brother Paul Blogging Theology's channel, not the one that I was on, but a different interview where he interviewed a Christian scholar, somebody whose expertise is in the New Testament and New Testament studies. He had an interview on James, the brother of Jesus. Now there's a text um, in the New Testament, which is attributed typically to James. Um, it's called the letter of James, and it's in the New Testament. And what we'll see here is that the Christian scholar is going to point out pretty clearly and emphatically that he believes whoever wrote the letter of James or what's attributed to James in the New Testament, they very clearly had a different position, different key theological position from Paul or the so-called Apostle Paul. And that is on what's called justification and um, how is it that human beings are reconciled to God. So many uh, Muslims may be familiar with Christians who say that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Well, is it just, you know, having faith in that, faith alone, that gets you to paradise or to heaven? Um, some Christians say yes, and other Christians say no. Now, it seems to be the case that justification is by faith alone, according to Paul or the Apostle Paul, whereas James, the brother of Jesus, says nothing of the sort, and in fact, emphasizes your works and your righteousness, just as Islam and Judaism uh, traditionally have done. It's not merely by that, of course. In Islam, we believe in the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we uh, need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. However, we don't believe in this concept of a human or God coming in the flesh, dying for our sins. Uh, nevertheless, I want to play this clip where this Christian scholar makes the case that James, the brother of Jesus, or whoever wrote the uh, letter in, in the New Testament attributed to James, very clearly differed with Paul on this, um, on this very fundamental theological doctrine of how we are reconciled to God. Now, this is very important because if that is the case, then, and I think it is a very obvious and apparent, which we'll see in just a moment, then this demonstrates that the Christian Bible cannot really be followed it because you, what you wind up having is a hodgepodge of these different theological positions in which writers like James will differ from Paul on how people make it to heaven and how people make it to paradise. So Christianity or Christianity from the perspective following it strictly from the Bible is not really a defensible position because you have all of these different writers, many of which we don't even know who they were, who had different theological backgrounds and agendas that contradict one another. So how can you follow all of them simultaneously? That's the problem that results. But anyway, let's go to the video and take a listen to what this Christian scholar had to say. Now, of course, I know that many Christians will disagree with him and maybe attempt to refute him or what I have to say, but he is somebody who is well-respected, Professor Dale C. Allison. Let's take a listen. So yeah. absolutely everything in that text that you can, if you want to, read as Christian, you can just as easily read as Jewish. And I think it probably fits in with this uh, fairly large body of apologetical literature where you are finding common ground. I don't think James is an argument. It's more like a presentation. Here, here's what we think, right? Uh, here's what our James thinks, and uh, yeah, we actually and actually we're not in line with that Paul guy you may have heard of because he believes in justification by faith. We believe in works too. Uh, yeah, chapter two actually sounds to me. Uh, I think it can be almost demonstrated that it's polemic against Paul, or at least some perception of Paul that he is this guy who says faith without works. That's that's just fine. This yeah. text says, oh, no, we don't believe that. We believe in works, too. What he's saying here, and I'm going to break this down, is that James, the book of James, chapter 2, seems to be, and he says, he thinks that it can almost be very clearly demonstrated, that whoever wrote James chapter 2 is attempting to refute the theology of Paul and this idea of justification by faith alone. Now, for those who are not familiar with it, let me share my screen and show you guys what James 
chapter 2 actually says. So this is James chapter 2, starting at verse 20 down to verse 24. James says, You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? Meaning it's by what he did, not mere faith. You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made completely, complete, sorry, by what he did. Again, emphasizing it's not just belief in God or belief in Jesus. No, you have to have actions that are uh, righteous. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was called God's friend. Just as the Quran says, by the way, he was called God's friend. You see that a person is, called, is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So very explicit, he said, people, and he uses the example of Abraham, are considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone as modern Protestants claim and many Christians would like people to believe, which they're basically following the doctrine of Paul. Now, that was from what James said. Now, you'll see that it seems like he's very clearly contradicting Paul in Romans chapters 3 and 4. So let's take a look here in Romans 3, verse 27 and 28, where he says, Where then is boasting? It is excluded because of what, what law? The law that requires works? Question mark. No, because of, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from wor the works of the law. Meaning by faith without the works of the law. When James said exactly the opposite, that a person cannot be justified by faith alone apart from the works of the law. Now, again, in Romans chapter 4, just to show that we're not cherry picking here, and I just want to show, uh, and I'm not really going into a detailed argument about the exegesis of Romans 3 and 4 and uh, James 2. No, I just wanted to show you the context of what that scholar was referring to for those who are not familiar with the book of James and Romans. So this is Romans 4, verses 1 to uh, 3. He says, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, by the way, which James said, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What the scriptures say, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So again, the same example that James gives, which is no coincidence, Paul gives regarding Abraham and says, no, he wasn't justified by works, he was justified by faith, right? Whereas James said he was justified by works and not by faith alone, right? So, and I'm not saying that James therefore believes that it's uh, works alone, he believes it's faith and works, not faith alone. Or, you know, this concept, oh, you just believe that Jesus died for your sins and, you know, you're going to heaven type of thing. Now, just to show you guys um, that this is not merely Professor Dale Allison's understanding, this was a controversy that came up even in um, Protestant circles amongst the early Protestant reformers like Martin Luther, because as I said, the implications are that if the book of James contradicts Romans and what Paul had to say, then how could they both be considered divine or sacred scripture? And so you actually had Martin Luther who challenged the idea that James should be considered sacred scripture. So let's see what Martin Luther had to say. Now this is from a text which is a preface to uh, the New Testament uh, translation that he gave and the books of the Bible. He says, therefore, St. James' epistle, meaning the epistle of St. James, is really an epistle of straw. Wow, why would you compare to, uh, say it as a epistle of straw? Compared to them, meaning compared to the other books of the New Testament, like Romans and other wor uh, works of Paul. For it has nothing of the nature of the gospel about it, but more on this in other prefaces. And I'm going to go to show 
what that other section is. But very clearly he says that the book of James cannot be compared to Romans or other books. He says it has nothing of the gospel within it. Well, from a Muslim perspective, that's what we would expect from James or his followers because we don't believe the early genuine followers of Jesus actually believed in this Christian understanding of the gospel that Jesus Christ died for your sins and he's God in the flesh and all this kind of business. So Martin Luther is admitting that his understanding of the gospel is nowhere to be found in the book of James, which Professor Dale Allison also detailed um, further in that same video, which I recommend people watch that entire interview. It was extremely interesting. Now, here is further from the section that uh, Martin Luther was referring to from the preface to the epistles of St. James and St. Jude. Now, this is in the 16th century, right? Now, let me just read to you what he says. It's only a couple pages here. He says, though this epistle of St. James was rejected by the ancients, I praise it and hold it to be a good book because it sets up no doctrine of men and lays great, great stress upon God's law. But now he's going to contradict that in all of the rest of what he says. Listen to what he says. But to state my own opinion about it, though without injury to anyone, I consider that it is not the writing of any apostle. So he doesn't consider this to be the writing of James the Apostle or an apostolic work in any sense. Now, if the books of the New Testament are supposed to be apostolic or at least uh, have some connection to the apostles, then that would mean that James should. But Martin Luther is saying that it doesn't, and he'll explain why. So his reasons for why he doesn't think it's an apostolic work are as follows. First, that it is flatly against St. Paul and all the rest of Scripture. So he admits that it completely contradicts Paul and the rest of Scripture. It ascribes righteousness to works and says that Abraham was justified by his works in that he offered his son Isaac, though St. Paul was on the contrary, teaches in Romans 4.2, which I read those texts, that Abraham was justified without works, by faith alone, right? And that's controversial, which um, in Martin Luther's translation of Romans, he actually inserted the word alone, which doesn't exist in the Greek because of his doctrine. And that's another problem, but I'll explain that in just a minute. So Abraham was justified without works, by faith alone, before he offered his son and, it, and proves it by Moses in Genesis 15.6. Now, although this epistle might be helped and a gloss be found for this work righteousness, it cannot be defended against applying to works the saying of Moses in Genesis 15, 6, which speaks only of Abraham's faith and not of his works, as St. Paul shows in Romans 4. This fault, therefore, leads to the conclusion that this is not the work of any apostle. So this book of James cannot be the work of any apostle because James chapter 2 directly contradicts Romans chapter 4. That's what he's saying. Now, what's the second reason for rejecting this book as coming from any apostle? He says its purpose is to teach Christians. And in all, the, all this long teaching, it does not once mention the passion, meaning that Jesus was crucified and died for the sins, the resurrection that he resurrected from the dead, or the Spirit of Christ. He names Christ several times, but he teaches nothing about him and only speaks of common faith in God, which is what we would expect as a Muslim from Jesus' real early followers. For it is the duty of a true apostle to preach of the passion and resurrection and work of Christ, and thus lay the foundation of faith, as he himself says in John 15, 27, Ye shall bear witness of me, all the genuine sacred books agree in this, and that all of them preach Christ and deal with Him. That this is the true test by which to judge all books when we, when we see whether they deal with Christ or not. Since the scriptures show us Christ, Romans 3.21, again quoting Paul, and St. Paul will know nothing but Christ, 1 Corinthians 15.2. Meaning, uh, Paul said he doesn't know anything about Jesus except Christ crucified. And because James didn't mention anything about Christ being crucified for the sins of, and the whole passion narrative and resurrection narrative of Jesus, he says, therefore, it cannot be truly a uh, work from an apostle. 
What does not teach Christ is not apostolic, even though St. Peter or Paul taught it again. What preaches Christ would be apostolic, even though Judas and uh, Annas and uh, Pilate and Herod did it. But this James does nothing more than drive to the law and its works, and he mixes the two up in such disorderly fashion that it seems to me he must have been some good pious man who took some sayings from the apostles, disciples, and threw them thus on paper, or perhaps they were written down by someone else from his preaching. He calls the law a law of liberty, meaning the Jewish law is a good thing. Though St. Paul calls it a law of slavery, of wrath, of death, and of sin. Galatians 3.23 and Romans 7.11. So Paul is very critical of the Jewish law where James is praising it. Moreover, in James 5.20, he quotes the sayings of St. Peter, Love covereth the multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4.8, and humbles, humble, your, humble yourselves under the hand of God. And again, 1 Peter 5.6. And of St. Paul, Galatians 5.10, The spirit lusteth against hatred. And yet, in point of time, St. James was put to death by Herod in Jerusalem before St. Peter. So, so it seems that he came long after St. Peter and Paul. In a word, he wants to guard against those, meaning James wants to guard against those who relied on faith without works, i.e. Paul, refuting him, and is unequal to the task in spirit, thought, and words, and rends the, script, rends the scriptures, and thereby resists Paul and all scriptures. So he's against Paul, he's saying, and would accomplish by insisting on the law what the apostles accomplished by inciting men to love. Therefore, I cannot put him among the chief books, though I would not thereby prevent anyone from putting him where he pleases and estimating him as he pleases. For there are many good sayings in him, meaning there's many good sayings in James, but he directly contradicts Paul and he's not actually preaching about Christ and the crucifixion and resurrection. And therefore, I can't really say that this is apostolic and uh, say that people should accept this as uh, being even really a part of the New Testament. Now he says, well, I can't prevent people from doing that, but if they do it, I don't agree with them. Concerning the epistle of St. Jude, no one can deny um, and now this is about uh, St. Jude, so that really doesn't matter. I just wanted to focus really on this idea of the epistle or the book of James. Now, what we showed was Dale Allison saying this. Then we showed what he was talking about from comparing James 2 to Romans chapters 3 and 4. Seems to be a clear contradiction. Martin Luther saw it as such a contradiction that he didn't believe that the book of James was actually from an apostle and doubted its authenticity because he admitted that it directly contradicted Paul and other scriptures and did not actually teach the narratives that you would exp expect on a Christian understanding. Now, just to show that I'm not misinterpreting Martin Luther here, here's a Christian scholar interpreting Luther. This is Philip Schaff in the famous uh, Schaff collection of the works of the uh, church fathers and earlier Christian writings. He says, and I quote, the most important example of dogmatic influence in Luther's version, meaning in Luther's version of the New Testament, is the famous interpolation of the word alone in Romans 3.28, by which he intended to emphasize his uh, solidifying doctrine of justification on the plea that the German idiom requires the insertion of, for the sake of clearness. But he thereby brought Paul into direct verbal conflict with James, who says, James 2.24, by works a man is justified and not, by, not only by faith. It is well known that Luther deemed it impossible to harmonize the two apostles in this article and characterizes the epistle of James as an epistle of straw because it had no evangelical character. He therefore insisted on this insertion in spite of all outcry against it. So Philip Schaff, the Christian um, scholar, modern Christian scholar, is admitting that Luther believed that it was impossible to reconcile uh, between the book of James and 
uh, Paul in the book of Romans, and to such an extent that he actually inserted in his German translation of Romans 3.28 the word alone to fit to his doctrine. Now, I want to show you that not all Protestant reformers agreed with this. For example, the other Protestant reformer, John Calvin, disagreed. He says in his commentary on James, the salutation is peculiar, but in the same form with the letter sent to Antioch by the apostles, of whom James was one, and the church at Jerusalem, Acts 15.23, it is therefore apostolic, although adopted from a form commonly used by the heathen writers. See Acts 23.26, John in John 2.10 and John 2.11. Uses the verb, and I can't read Greek, but in a similar sense, and it means properly to rejoice. It being an infinitive, the verb, again in Greek, to say or to bid is put before it by John and is evidently understood here. Hence the salutation may thus be rendered, and he goes on to explain it. But he says very clearly that he views this expression in James as apostolic, meaning he believes that it's coming from an apostle. Now how John Calvin and others who follow him and believe in the Protestant uh, doctrine of being saved through Christ by faith alone and not works at all, how people uh, go on to try to reconcile that, I'll let them explain that to you. But nevertheless, we see a clear difference of opinion here between Luther and Calvin, where Luther on the one hand is saying he doesn't consider James, the book of James apostolic because it contradicts other scripture, especially Paul and Romans, and therefore he doesn't consider it really to be genuine scripture in that sense, to be apostolic, whereas John Calvin considers it to be apostolic and attempts to uh, give some type of interpretation to make both James and Paul fit one another. Now, I actually don't believe that that act can be done consistently, so I would agree that with Luther that Christians have a genuine problem there. Nevertheless, um, it's clear that the Protestant reformers differed on this and that the book of James did cause such a problem. Now, I want that to be clear not only to my Muslim audience, to, but to the Christian audience, because this demonstrates that you guys don't even have a very clear understanding of what is apostolic, who wrote these texts in the New Testament. Many of them, even besides the book of James, are anonymous. Why should we trust them? And the book of James itself, Luther admits, doesn't have these doctrines of Christianity, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, him being God in the flesh, and all this other business. It just talks about believing basically in God and being a righteous person, which is what we would expect from the true followers as a Muslim, what we would expect from the true followers of Jesus. Now, James, if he truly was the brother of uh, Jesus, as the New Testament claims, and as it claims to be you know, written by James, or at least attributed to him, whether he had scribes or whatnot, this is actually evidence of at least a semblance of the Muslim narrative existing even in the New Testament, even amongst the early followers of Jesus. And you don't have this concept of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, being God in the flesh, and all this kind of business. Um, and so the Christians allowed this to slip in the New Testament. It seems obviously to contradict the Paul and other places in the New Testament, as this Christian scholar Dale Allison admits, as Martin Luther really had struggled with, and as um, what we just re read from Philip Schaff and his interpretation of Luther as well. With that being said, guys, I hope that you found this video uh, informative and educational. If you want to see more information on it, I recommend going to watch that full video and interview on Brother Paul's channel. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more videos like it on my channel, then please consider subscribing to the channel and putting the notification bell on to get notified of future videos. Also, consider liking this video as well as the other videos that you've enjoyed on my channel. Really does help with the algorithm. Comment on these videos and let me know your thoughts. Also, share this with your friends and family or people who you think will be interested in these videos or on your social media platforms, no matter how big or how small, it really does help. 
If you want to go above and beyond, then as I've mentioned before at the end of my videos, if you want to donate and support my channel because my I'm doing this full time now, guys, and my channel continuing to run and publish these kind of videos depends on you guys and your support, then the best way to do so would be to donate at the GoFundMe link, which is pinned at the top of the description of this video, as well as my other videos. With that being said, guys, I want to thank you all again for watching and your continued support. I'll see you all again next time, insha'Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.